Welcome to a special edition of the 10 Minute Topic. I have on the program today, Sam Ashu. He's a medical doctor from Florida, an ER doctor, and we're gonna talk about something I think is important to the audience, just the nature of the ER. And especially in a time like this when we're dealing with a pandemic, many of my audience are 50 plus, and many, not many, hopefully none of you have to go to the ER, but in this pandemic, I'm expecting a few of you are gonna to have to, and I want to talk about the dynamics behind all that. Mm -hmm. And I want to be sure that we kind of clear up any of the misconceptions of what happens in an ER. And we can do that by kind of talking this out. Let's just talk about the symptoms here are cough, fever, sometimes there's runny nose, uh, but oftentimes there's chest pain. Uh, that goes along with acute respiratory distress syndrome in the in the COVID pandemic. How do you triage something like that in the ER, doctor? So the primary symptom we're looking for is shortness of breath, and that's really the tilting point. So if you have fever and cough and sore throat and just a little discomfort, then staying at home or staying in contact with your primary care doctor is just fine. When we start to see shortness of breath, struggling to breathe, that's symptoms that are concerning and something that we need to know about uh, more urgently. So that's usually when we recommend people start coming to the emergency department. And those are the kinds of questions we're going to ask when you get there. So uh, I would say first and foremost, at any emergency department now, uh, they're most concerned with whether or not you're infectious or infected, and so, you could even start the conversation by saying, I've been ill, I've had a fever, and now it's getting worse and I have shortness of breath. And that'll go a long way in helping them with the first probably 10 questions they're going to ask you as you walk in the door so that they can determine, are you a potential COVID-19 patient or someone who's been infected with coronavirus? Or if you're one of the other people who has a different kind of emergency. Well, everyday emergency rooms for, you know, generations have had to deal with people coming in with, I have shortness of breath, cardiovascular, pneumonia, we'll, we'll figure it out for you. This just adds to that because, you, you know, you're, a 55-year-old going in is in the past been a cardiovascular patient. Now it's a person who has been subjected to this pandemic. Yeah, that's correct. So shortness of breath is very nonspecific. It doesn't mean you have COVID-19, but there are a cluster of diseases, a lot of them heart related, like you mentioned, that make you short of breath. Uh, but there are a couple of other hints, things like fever and the preceding illness uh, that any one of uh, the program watchers can uh, share with the paramedics or with the staff in the emergency department uh, as part of that history. Uh, of, uh, of their illness, and that'll help clue them into, okay, this is not the typical kind of shortness of breath we see. Uh, but obviously there's going to be some diagnostic testing there afterwards so that we can start to tease out which one of the problems you have. So we're dealing now globally with uh, COVID-19, and I'm sure you've seen the video coming out of Italy and other parts of Europe, mm. uh, interviewing these doctors in their ERs where they're just like, we're working all the time. We're not mm -hmm. catching up, we're overrun. Uh, we don't have PPEs, personal protective equipment anymore. We have to rewash what we got. We don't have ventilators. Um, a lot of people are watching that and they're fearful that's gonna happen in America. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have what we need here in America for resources? Uh, clearly, I don't think we have enough physicians, but you know, help, help me out here. Uh, I think there have been several reports now of hospitals in the U.S. that are short on things like personal protective equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are news reports, uh, even in some large metropolitan areas where uh, there are a large number of COVID-19 patients and hospitals are becoming overwhelmed uh, and they're becoming short on, on personal protective equipment. So yes, it is happening here in the U.S. Uh, I would not say that it's happening in every city in the U.S., but certainly if you look at cities where there are large clusters of patients, you'll see hospitals that are 
uh, running out of equipment or becoming overwhelmed. Yeah, I live uh, just north of New York City. I'm here in Connecticut. And in New York City, the reporting hospital is now at about 60% uh, full. Mm -hmm. Here in Connecticut, we only have four COVID hospitalized patients. Mm -hmm. It's it's much different. Uh, it is. You, you know, from scene to scene. And obviously, population density, uh, earlier access to being uh, in the surroundings of the COVID uh, germ. You know, there's, there's so much going on here. Yeah, I think... Uh there, there is a lot going on, and there's a lot going on that's contemplated on a national and public health uh, perspective that's not usually considered by your typical patient. So, for example, uh, sure, New York City has a lot of cases uh, and is at 60 percent um, capacity in most hospitals, but New York City also has a very, very large population and a very large number of supporting hospitals in that area. Uh, where you are, for example, I would think even though you have very few COVID-19 patients, that you probably have very few hospitals uh, immediately in your vicinity. And well, uh, Actually, I have Yale. Mm -hmm. uh, I have Bridgeport. Uh, we have Hartford. We have some large hospitals, mm -hmm. but... Um, the you know the Bridgeport Hospital is more of a impoverished hospital. Mm -hmm. Yale is a, a university hospital. Mm -hmm. Hartford is also an impoverished hospital. So, and I'd you know. say you know you're you're lucky. So then you have three centers close to you. Mm -hmm. um, there are some. I would say the majority of the smaller cities in the U.S. rely on one to two hospitals. That's right. And yeah. uh, and in those scenarios, it's very easy for a hospital to become overwhelmed, even with a handful of patients. Uh, there's something unique about COVID-19, and that's that the patients who are sick with that disease are infectious, uh, very infectious, even to the healthcare personnel who are taking care of them, and they require special isolation. And typically, we don't have a lot of this kind of disease uh, in the U.S., and so most of your typical hospital rooms are not what we call airborne isolation rooms. They're not equipped to be uh, special um, special needs rooms for those that have a contagious disease that can be transmitted through the air or as easily as coronavirus. And so when you look at the number of hospitals in your area, even with three hospitals close to you, I would say that there are probably remarkably few airborne isolation rooms, yeah, even between all three of those centers. And I so, think what they did a study right when this broke out, we have 50 in the state. Yeah. yeah. In the state. Yeah. In the state. Exactly. So, so it, th those resources will become overwhelmed very, very quickly. And then you'll see that uh, hospitals are adjusting then to how else they can provide isolation and, uh, and prevent other people from becoming infected. And then you'll start to see things that have been tested and tried in places like Italy, uh, where uh, people are cohorted together. So mm -hmm. you know, people who have the similar disease are placed in similar areas uh, because they are already infected and the area is cordoned off either with plastic sheets or uh, special environmental scrubbers and you lose the ability to put people in individual rooms perhaps you have a roommate um, those are the kinds of things that we have to resort to just to find locations uh, to i've treat seen people and uh, doctors in italy uh, hook up the ventilator from four people you know in, in the same room hmm. yeah i mean it, it's just something they had to do so it's strange times. Now that's how hospitals are adapting. How does a doctor have to adapt? Uh, because when I went from ambulance to hospital room all the way through, nobody had gloves. Mm -hmm. Nobody wore a mask. That just wasn't start of the, part of the standard practice. And it really isn't in ERs. You have to be yeah, in Yeah, I think in, today you'll find that gloves are, are a basic. And so okay. you'll, you'll notice that in, in any setting. Um, that's just part of normal personal protective equipment, uh, even for paramedics and ambulances. Uh, with this particular infection, you'll notice that people are wearing masks or perhaps what they call a respirator, which is uh, just a, a more uh, vigorous mask that can filter the air uh, in, uh, in a way that a typical surgical mask can't. And mm -hmm. so uh, it'll look rounded and it'll cover their face. Or uh, in some cases, they might be wearing a helmet and a hood with a small little uh, machine that scrubs the air and provides air into the helmet. Uh, those are all different kinds of devices. Uh, people also will be wearing gowns and they'll be wearing uh, hats. Uh, they'll likely have on goggles or a face shield. 
and then they might have shoe covers on as well. And that's really protecting all of the frontal surface areas that are facing the patient uh, when they're coughing or sneezing or even breathing rapidly. How does an ER prep for something like a pandemic? Education is the key at start. So uh, learning to recognize the symptoms of the disease and making sure everybody knows the right questions to ask as soon as someone comes in the door. Uh, and then uh, discussing protocols. So depending on the burden of the disease, those protocols change. So for example, when you first begin to see patients, you're gonna put them in isolation. As you run out of isolation, you need to have a secondary protocol. What do we do now? Are we gonna block off part of the emergency department and call that the COVID-19 area? Um, and then you have to make sure you have the correct equipment. You have to make sure people are educated on how to put on and take off that equipment so they don't contaminate themselves uh, and that you have adequate supply of all of the equipment you need. And lastly, you need to understand how to treat whatever the, the pandemic disease is. Uh, and in this particular scenario, as things are unfolding on a daily basis, that also changes quite quickly. Uh, and so someone has to be your, uh, your educator, your information supplier for, for the team. Well, COVID-19 also has what I call the burden of time. Uh, I have a friend who had chest pain. He went in, they stinted him. He was home by 6 p.m. the next day. Yeah, pretty amazing. Okay, yeah, that's cool. That is very cool. You know, however, COVID-19, you check in, and as your systems get worse, they may start you on just a, uh, a face mask and supplemental oxygen. If that doesn't work, they'll put the oxygen in your nose. If that doesn't work, they, they intubate you. And this whole process from intubation to they finally discharge, if you survive, is 20, 22 days out of what we learned from Italy. That's a long burden of time for a hospital for a single patient. It is. And that's for uh, the likely, the sickest patient, right? It could be even longer, actually. If you spend a long time in the ICU, it could be longer than 22 days easily. Uh, and, and you're right. That is a long time for a patient to spend in the hospital. Currently, the healthcare system in the U.S. doesn't have a high volume of those kinds of patients which is another challenge with this particular disease. Uh, we are seeing higher numbers of those patients, much like Italy has, uh, that, uh, that require longer stays. And if you're in a room or taking up a bed for a longer period of time, that is just that much more time. We can't give that resource to another patient. So there, the places fill faster when people stay longer, absolutely. Let's talk about something scary, intubation. Mm. Okay, they're gonna treat you initially with oxygen, and for many people, that's going to work just fine. Uh, they may put a, uh, oxygen in your nose just to give it a little stronger uh, percentage of oxygen. But at a certain point, that may not work. And the doctor's going to say, listen, my best course of treatment now is to uh, sedate you, paralyze you, and intubate you. And we're going to lay you on your belly. And this allows your lungs to heal because mm. they're, they're not healing right now. There's just nothing we can do. This is the best thing we can do. Tell me about intubation. How does that, how does that work? It's uh, first the decision to intubate someone is achieved after multiple steps like you described. So it's primarily a way to get oxygen into your blood when your lungs are injured. And so initially we start with a little bit of what's called nasal cannula, the prongs that go into your nose. Uh, if that doesn't work, you're switched over to a mask. If that doesn't work, perhaps you're actually bridged with something called a CPAP or BiPAP machine. Uh, many people sleep with those at night, you know, CPAP masks. Uh, and so there we have similar machinery in the hospital to help. Some of that pressure that it can provide will help oxygenate the blood when the lung is injured. Then there are those who have deteriorated so much uh, that even that doesn't work. Uh, and at that point, Intubation uh, is the process of sedating someone, putting them completely to sleep, uh, often paralyzing them so they don't struggle against the machine and can rest their muscles, and then inserting a plastic tube through the mouth, down between the vocal cords, and, and sitting just above the, um, the, in the trachea, but just above where it separates to each lung, uh, and then directly providing air and oxygen in that manner. 
And what that does is uh, that, that tube has a little balloon at the end, and when the balloon's inflated, it kind of seals that system in and allows for extra additional pressure to be applied directly to the lungs, extra oxygen to be given directly into the lungs in hopes that that will be sufficient uh, and gain more time for the body then to combat the virus and start reversing the damage. I'll say that, in my opinion, that's a, a critical decision point. And we as physicians globally uh, talk to our patients about their wishes, you know, their advanced directives. Do you ever want to be intubated? Do you ever want to have CPR if your heart stops? Um, if you're listening to this program uh, and you've never had that conversation with your doctor, uh, with your children, uh, with, your, uh, with your spouse, then you should. And you should do that today uh, because uh, I'll give you an example. I've had this conversation with my mother multiple times and I know her wishes uh, and I've known them for years uh, and she's in her uh, mid-70s currently, but she fits into this high-risk population of people who have medical problems that put them at risk. Uh, and so it, it doesn't make the decision um, easier, uh, but it, it's important to know the desires of the person, the patient, um, ahead of time. And if, uh, if you haven't given it some thought, now is a good time because at some point the physician is going to come to you as a patient and say, we've reached this decision point and I need to know what you want to do. Here are your options. Uh, and it might be that you're not in a position to make that decision. And then we have to rely on your spouse or your children. And if that's the case, it would go a long way for them to know what your wishes would be in that scenario. Tell somebody. Yes. <laughs> write it down. Tell <laughs> write somebody it down. and write it down. <laughs> Tell somebody. Um, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, being intubated was, you know, for a long period of time, they were talking about a mortality rate of almost 50%. Mm. You know, it, it was it was pretty sad. We now have different uh, techniques with flow rates, with uh, uh, adjusting the body and stuff like that, where the mortality rate over a long period of time is down to 10%, mm. which that's amazing. The... You know, the mortality associated with just the procedure mm -hmm. uh, is is low. So mm -hmm. we, we do have come a long way in reducing the mortality rate just from intubating someone. We've got lots of equipment and backup procedures, and if things go wrong, lots of rescue methods. And emergency physicians and anesthesiologists and pulmonologists, those critical care doctors, are well-versed in all of those techniques. It's not so much the procedure that's the problem, it's the disease that's resulting in you needing the procedure that's Correct. the problem. And so when we intubate someone, the real question is, as far as their outcome, is why are we doing it and what's the chance of recovery from this disease process before we even do it? And that's a completely fair question to ask. It, when we talk about COVID-19, uh, it's again, it's very preliminary data, but what we know from looking at Italy and China is that if you're over age 65 and you have multiple medical problems and you've escalated to the point of needing to be intubated, your mortality, that's the chance that you're going to die from this disease, uh, is well over 25, 30%. Uh, and we don't know the exact number. We just know it's higher than that. So you've got somewhere around a one in three, one in four chance of dying at least, uh, if you have already escalated to this point. Uh, and that's the question that we should be asking at that point. We'll say, we can do this procedure. This is what we anticipate the outcome to be. Uh, we can't predict the future, but we can give you, uh, based on prior patient case scenarios, uh, a, a rough estimate of what your chances are. And then you have to make a decision whether or not you want us to proceed. All right, let's finish up with self-isolation. Mm -hmm. Okay, right now it's the best thing we could do. Uh, they're recommending six feet apart, don't go to crowds. Uh, if you can, if you have to have your Texas Roadhouse get takeout. Um, here in Connecticut, they've shut down all the restaurants as far as dine-in. I can't get my hair cut, which has really been a problem. <laughs> Mine people, too. <laughs> yeah, you know, people, oh, Kevin, man, hippie. So, society has completely changed to a brand new normal mm -hmm. um self-isolation explain what it is and why it's the best solution 
Yeah, so we talk about uh, the, uh, the difference between social distancing and social isolation. At least I talk about it with people. Okay. Uh, we're talking about social distancing, which is really uh, keeping yourself six feet apart from someone who might potentially be infected because if they cough, that little droplet can carry about three to five feet and you want to be just outside that, that area. Uh, when we talk about social distancing as a population, then yeah, we're trying to decrease how many people are gathering together in close quarters for long periods of time in order to slow the passage of this disease from one person to the next throughout the country. We're trying to decrease the number of people who are sick at any given time. We fully understand it's going to spread through the country. Social distancing isn't going to prevent the disease from spreading throughout the US. It's only going to slow it. And slowing it can go a long way in making sure that there's a bed in the ICU available for you when you or one of your family members becomes ill uh, because the total number of patients sick at any given time is lower. That's different than social isolation, which of course is just having no contact with anyone. Well, we, uh, we have lots of tools available. So, you know, a uh, lot of introverts are like, I've been doing this forever, it's really easy, I'll show you how. It's true, but if you're not an introvert and you're accustomed to seeing your grandchildren, you know, again, uh, going hearkening back to my parents, uh, I live in the same city as my parents and I take my children over to see them all the time, but we do rely now on things like FaceTime and Skype and other methods of video communication. You'd be surprised how easy it is to touch in or, or call sure. and ch touch base with someone multiple times a day and just make sure they're okay and maintain that contact without being isolated but while being distant. So it's an important differentiator. I don't want people to think we're advocating you have to be isolated and a hermit. It, no. if, if it sounds great to you, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I heard the doctor say, listen, when you're outside in the world, pretend like everybody you meet has it. Mm. When you're inside with your family, pretend you have it and that you're trying to prevent them from getting it. Sure. And you know, that, that's kind of the rules of the road of the new normal. Eh, I like it, it. it makes sense. Doctor, I want to thank you for your time. I hope we never have to have you back in the program. Yeah. But uh, I, certainly if it, things get worse and uh, we need more doctor advice, uh, I'd like to invite you back and give us uh, 10 minutes of your time. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. All right.